Good morning, Good Shepherd. We're so glad you're joining us today. Good morning, Facebook. Good morning, YouTube. And good morning over at Roku. And good morning over at our website, www.goodchurch.us. Write this down www.goodchurch.us. Hop on there and find out what's happening all around the church. Places you can plug into, places you can come and hang out and do stuff with us, events that are coming up. Do it. We're so glad you're joining today. Today is Sunday, October 17th. It is the 289th day of the year, which means we only have 76 days until 2022. Can you believe it? We only have 69 days until Christmas. We love Christmas around here. And we have 39 days until Thanksgiving. Fun fact, today is National Pasta Day, National Black Poetry Day, National Mulligan Day. I've had to use mulligans out on the golf courses. Pumpkin Patch is here. Pumpkin, pumpkin Patch volunteers needed. That's you and you and you. We need you volunteering over in the Pumpkin Patch. You know how this works. We really would love to see you out there taking pictures with people, holding people's cameras, saying hi to them, and letting them pick out pumpkins for their place. It's a fantastic cause. It goes to the Boys and Girls Country. We have been serving them for a long time. Really, we learn from them. We get to help them, but we get taught by them because we're helping those kids out there. And, and uh, uh, it's a fantastic cause to be a part of. Uh, the pumpkins have arrived, so we need people to sign up for a few more nights. Sign up today on our website. Uh, you can click the link and, and jump, jump in there and see who, where, you, where there's empty spots. Fill it in for us, will you? Or email missyo at goodchurch.us. Missy will help you out. She'll answer all your questions. Missyo at goodchurch.us. That's Missy Owls. That's the adult leadership uh, director. Missy Owls or Missy O at goodchurch.us. Sunday, October 31st at 4 p.m. Concert in the Patch returns with some added fun. We will host a trunk or treat. So sign up to host a trunk. That's the back of your tailgate of your truck or your RV or your cars or your trunks of your cars. Uh, we need you to sign up for that. Trunk or treat. Sign up to host a trunk. We're about halfway full. Spaces are limited. Uh, I think we're halfway. I think we're a little over halfway full. So um, the spaces are limited, we, but we need you. We still need you. You can do your game right in front of it. You can do, you can come out, host a game on the other side, all those type of things. Come out volunteer with us. Uh, use your trunk. We need to use your trunk of your car uh, for the kiddos uh, in the area. That's, that's going to happen Sunday, October 31st. Um, dress the kiddos and dress yourself. Visit the decorated cars in the parking lot. Bring a lawn chair for the concert and some friends to share in the experience. Ask your neighbors to come out. Another amazing ramp build is coming so Saturday, November 6th. Saturday, November 6th is a ramp build. Are you handy with your tools and want to do good in our community? Building a ramp for a local family in need is a great way to get involved with the repair of the world. Contact Bob Bassett, or you'll see Bob around here. If you see Bob, say hi to Bob. Uh, uh, his information is bobbassett at comcast.net, uh, or you can get, contact the front desk. Men's Ministry Golfing outing is Saturday, November 13th. Be there, 10 a.m. Men's Ministry will meet once again at Top Golf in Katy for a golf, for a day of golf and fellowship. No matter your skill level, bring your swing and join in the fun. You don't need clubs. They got clubs there. They got the balls. They got everything you need there. Uh, come out and uh, and hang out with us at the Top Golf in Katy. Register for that on our website or call the front desk, 281-373-2273. Ask for Cindy Kling. She will get. She will help you plan accordingly. Our GSUMC Family Mission Workday is Sunday, November 14th. Get a pen out. Family Mission Workday is Sunday, November 14th at 12 p.m. right here after church. Every day in Houston, one and out of four preschool-age children may not know where their next meal is coming from, but you can do something, and you can do something, and I can do something about that. Bring the whole family, join us, and decorate lunch sacks and fill them with prepackaged, non-perishable food items. We need you November the 14th at 12 right after church, packing those lunch and drawing things on them. Non-perishable food, loading those non-perishable food items and prepackaged food items. Let us show your kids. Let us show our kids how we can help the, those all those around us. Register for GSUMC Family Mission Workday Sunday, November the 14th at 12 p.m. Right after church. We miss you. We love you, and we hope to see you soon. Here's your senior pastor, Matt Neela, to say good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. Good morning, Jason. Well, hey everybody. Hope you guys are doing well. We're um, yeah. Wow. What about this weather? Like this is this is the reason we live here the other eight months of the year, right? So. Hey, just want to say, uh, uh, want to let you know, and I know Jason probably already talked about this, but if you didn't get the word, we're doing trunk or treat here on the 31st. That's a Sunday. It's outdoors, so the, we the weather's probably going to be incredible. 
Um, and I know some of you aren't comfortable being in a room with folks, but maybe you're comfortable hosting a trunk uh, for kids. So we hope that you'll sign up for that, and we look forward to seeing you guys soon. We love you guys. Bye. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, is that weather incredible out there or what? I have half a mind just to say, all right, we're going outside, everybody. Worship yes. outside today. I remember when I, we were in like elementary school, middle, middle school, some teacher about once a year, some, a teacher would say, hey, let's go and we're going to go have class out by the tree. I'd be like, yes, this is that kind of day. But unfortunately, we need microphones and screens and streaming and all the stuff that we do in here. But anyway, so we're super glad that you're here today. Uh, my name is Matt Neely. I'm one of the pastors here at Good Shepherd, and just want to say a word of welcome to all of you. We know that there are always other choices. Um, there are so many things in our culture today that you could be doing today, but what you've chosen to do is to be in the house of God. We think that you've made a great choice, and our prayer for everybody here, whether you're a first-time guest or you've been here for almost 30 years, um, you know, our prayer for everybody is that uh, we would have an encounter with the living God. This isn't just about uh, you know, saying some prayers and doing some things and reading this book that's, you know, several thousand years old. It's, we do all of those things because we believe that they point to a living God who's still living and active today. So, uh, so welcome to Good Shepherd this morning. I do want to say a special word of welcome to any first-time guests that we have this morning, whether you're down here or you're on the farthest of the top row up there. We see you, whether you're at home in your uh, living room in pajamas. Uh, we see you as well. We don't really see you. That's weird. But, um, but we, we see that you guys are with us, and we're glad that you're with us. I do want to, um, if you are a guest this morning, I hope you will text the word welcome uh, to the phone number that's up on the screen uh, right now, and that, uh, that's going to help us get to know you better. We'll send a link to you. You can just let us know that you're here. And one of the things we like to do is to send a, guest to all of our, uh, a gift to all of our first-time guests. So if you'll uh, give us that information, we'll just, it's just a simple way for us to know that you're here and start that conversation with you, let you know about some upcoming things, that kind of stuff. So we would love for you to do that. If you are a guest and you're in the room, I hope that you will uh, stop. Uh, there, we have a welcome desk out here that uh, we'll have somebody in between services. You can stop and ask any questions that you want. Certainly feel free to, to reach out to any of our staff. Reach out to me. I'll be standing at this door out here on the way uh, after the service is over. So I'd love to meet you and put a face with your name and all those things. So anyway, so welcome this morning. Uh, one other thing I want to let you know about. On every other row, there should be one of these attendance pads, uh, connect pads, and it looks just like this. And I hope that you will take a second right now to take, it, take this, uh, fill it out. What you're going to do is you'll, you know, just put your name. If your information has changed or if you're new, you can put your address, email, phone number, any of that stuff. Um, and then what you'll do is, uh, what we'd love for you to do is also let us know any prayer concerns. We take those really seriously. And we do this because we like to know who's here. When people's attendance patterns change, we know that sometimes that means, hey, something's going on. So we like to be able to reach out to you. Um, if you haven't been here for four or five or six weeks, 
So if you start getting a, a, a card from us after six weeks of not being here, it may not be that you haven't been. It may just be that you haven't filled this out. Uh, so uh, uh, you should fill this out. So this morning, what you'll do is you'll take it, you'll tear out your piece, you'll put it in the offering plate later in the service, and then you'll uh, make sure that pe the row behind you has the opportunity to fill it out as well. So that's all I have in terms of uh, kind of informational stuff to begin the service. I want to invite you to pray with me at this time, if you would. Lord God, thank you so much for this day, and I thank you for who you are, and that you are not uh, dead, that you are a living God. You still speak to us in living ways. God, I pray that you would help us today to hear your word today, to hear um, a bit of who you are and what you want for, uh, for us and from us. And God, I pray that uh, you would change us in such a way that it sends us out the door to change this world that we live in. And we're praying all of these things as we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning and next week, Rachel Chow is out. Her family is visiting from Taiwan, and so she wanted to take a little bit of time to be away with them. And so we are blessed this morning by having Chow and Bonbright with us on piano. Will you say welcome to her, and thanks for a great playing. I'm also grateful to Andy Easton for conducting He Never Says No, which is the type of friend you want to have. Our opening hymn is Standing on the Promises of God. I invite you to stand and join in singing together. really fun for us when we get to do that. 
Friends, will you remain standing for our affirmation of faith? Again, we're going to do the Victory Creed. We brought it out last week, and it worked well, so we'll try it again this week. Will you join with me with these words of faith? We believe that God is the only true creator of all. And since the initiation of creation, God has been ever present on earth as in heaven. When sin attempts to break God's creation, God's eternal promise endures through the covenants old and new. God reconciled our brokenness through Christ Jesus and revealed that reconciliation from the cross to the empty tomb and his ascension until the day we rejoice in the new heaven and new earth. God sustains us through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is the Almighty. The Spirit's power is limitless. And Christ is the great victor. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Turn to somebody near you, welcome him to Good Shepherd, and pass the peace of Jesus Christ. Welcome. Good. We missed you. to join together in prayer. As many of you know, in our sermon series, Look in the Mirror, we are going through our life marks of the church, of what we think a disciple looks like. Today we're talking about uh, share faithfully. Um, and so I'd just like to read a couple verses from Philemon. Paul says this, when I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith towards the Lord Jesus, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. Let's pray. Holy God, we give you thanks for all of the gifts that you pour upon us in our lives. We know that upon our souls you have given us a salvation, a healing that is so wonderful, a forgiveness that is so great that you have called us to share that um, deep experience of love that we receive from you with all of those that we encounter. We pray that we don't share the faith out of some sort of guilt, that we don't share our faith because we feel we have to, but we share our faith because we have been so transformed and so deeply connected to you that we cannot help but our faith eking out into every conversation and action that we have in this world that when we perceive all of the things that God has done for us and is doing in this world, that our perception of the truth of your scripture, the truth of your word, impels us, compels us to go out into the world and to share that faith in, in the words that we say and the actions that we do. And in order to do that, God, we just confess to you that we need your help. So we just pray the Spirit would... Uh, be with us that would give us the courage and the grace and the conviction to share that faith. We pray for all of those in our congregation at this time in need of your presence, those suffering illness, those dealing with grief, those dealing um, with all the challenges of the world today. We pray that as a congregation you enabled us to live into this mission, to be transformed by your love and share those with, the, with those that we encounter. And we pray all of this praying as your son taught us to pray.
For the giving moment, we like to focus on the ways in which we give to this community, uh, all of the ministry that we provide. I wanted to announce uh, an event that's going to happen in just about a month. So on November 14th, uh, the Missions Committee has put together an opportunity for us to serve. And what we're going to do is immediately after church on the 14th, we are going to go to the gym and we're going to pack up meals for kids meals. Uh, Kids Meals is a nonprofit organization that provides 7,000 meals for children in need throughout the city of Houston every single day. Um, and so we are going to provide the materials and the packing for that to help them um, distribute those meals and provide non-perishable kind of things so that if they need them, they are able to use that. So I'm excited about this because I've been part of this congregation a long time. I always hear from people that, that you as a congregation, that we as a congregation, want opportunities to have hands-on mission opportunities to do something. Um, and we have taken that seriously as a missions committee. We put this together. Now there's a little hesitation about how much meals we are able to pack. And I'm optimistic that we can get enough people to come right after service uh, to pack a whole bunch of meals and um, I, want, I want to be uh, right in that. So if you are, because I believe that we can, I believe I want us to come and pack them all so quickly that we're like, oh, we could have done more. That's my goal for you. Um, so if, if you are able, and this sounds like something you can do, that right after church on the 14th, you're, you're able to come pack meals. This is a opportunity that is appropriate for all ages. Uh, we're encouraging families to come with kids. We're encouraging the youth to be part of this. We're encouraging all adults to be part of this. It's an opportunity for us to serve as a congregation. So if you are able to come, that sounds like something like, yes, I'm going to be there. If you would go to our website and the signups and just register, tell us that you're coming. If we get a certain amount, we can gauge how many meals we'll be able to pack, whether that's 2,000 or even more. Um, I think that this is going to be a great opportunity. So if you've been looking for that kind of opportunity, this is something to do. And let us know that you're coming so we're able to buy the proper amount of supplies. Uh, things like this, creating more opportunities for us to be in mission and in service to the world, uh, to all of the mission and ministry that we do, is all meant to point towards that transforming love of Jesus. And we are trying to put that into every single relationship that we have. All of this is empowered and made possible by your gifts, by your generosity. I give you thanks for that. Um, it is part of this meaningful work that we do. So as we come to the giving moment, if you do give, give because you believe in the opportunities like this of working together as a congregation to point towards the love of Christ. I'll leave you with these words of Jesus who said, freely you have received, freely give. Thank you.
Let's stand and praise God together. This morning's scripture passage comes from the Gospel of Matthew. That's the first book of the New Testament, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. This morning I'm going to be reading from the Common English Bible translation, which is one we don't use very often around here. But no matter what translation you have, it should match up pretty well. Hear now the word of the Lord. You are the light of the world. A city on top of the hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on top of a lampstand, and it shines on all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so they can see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 1578, there was a Spanish Carmelite mystic poet priest. That is a big resume to start off a sermon with. Spanish Carmelite mystic poet priest named St. John of the Cross. And he had an amazing conversion experience that he penned in a poem called Dark Night. We know it as the dark night of the soul. If you took the emotionally healthy spirituality class, one of the chapters in that book and study is based on this poem. He talks about how he found Christ in the darkness. Hear these words. And in the luck of night, in secret places where no other spied, I went without my sight, without a light to guide, except the heart that lit me from inside. It guided me and shone surer than noonday sunlight over me and led me to the one whom only I could see deep in a place where only we could be. On June 10th, 2007, I had my dark night of the soul. It was a life-changing moment. I had left a career and education to be a professional opera singer and switched my vocational interests to theology and work in the church, meaning that I had to leave my doctoral program and switch to a different one. I had just changed jobs, and I moved from Austin to a very, very, very strange city that I did not understand called College Station. <laughs> my relationship with my brother Reagan was broken, and it had no signs of recovery, and that hurt. And it was big part my fault. My relationship with the girl I had been dating for five years was on its last legs. It was obvious. I knew that it was near the end, and that hurt too. I didn't know God. I definitely didn't know Christ. My faith was theoretical at best, even though I worked in the church, even though I studied religion in school, my faith was distant at best. 
So on that night, I was in Florida, in Jacksonville, Florida, gone for school, and they had a required wholeness and healing service. And so I begrudgingly attended. I would have rather been at the hotel not sitting around and doing a worship service. So I went in and I sat three rows from the back, way, way back up there, all by myself. No one around me. And I just sat through the service. And they sang and they did the liturgy and there was a sermon and it had no effect on me whatsoever. And then it came time for participation. The usher came and he said, will you go forward? And I got up and wandered down the center aisle. And the first thing I came to was the baptismal font. It's in the center of this beautiful church, Grace Episcopal Church in um, Orange Park, Florida, which is part of Jacksonville. And there I was to dip my hands in the water and splash them up. And when I did, I felt that cold, life-saving water that I had forgotten because of adolescence and chronological maturity. But it didn't have much of an effect on me as I remembered my baptism. I went on down to the altar rail. I took the host, the bread, the body of Christ. I drank from the common chalice to remember the new covenant. And it didn't have an effect on me. I turned right and went to the outer side of the transom, and there was one of the pastors, Dr. Carlo Waterman, and she had anointing oil and was there ready to anoint me. This is the wholeness and healing part of the service. And she said, Sterling, what can I pray for you? And I couldn't say anything. And she asked again. She said, Sterling, what, what can I pray for you? I couldn't say a word. My lips wouldn't move. Carla was frustrated. <laughs> she didn't know what to do with me. So she called over one of her colleagues, Dr. Reggie Kidd. And Reggie came over and he said, Sterling, Carla needs to know what you want prayed for. I'll pray for you. What am I praying for? I couldn't say a word. So out of frustration, they slapped a little oil on my forehead, made the sign of a cross, and said, we pray for your wholeness and healing. Go back to your seat. So I trod up the outside aisle of the church, humiliated feeling greater shame than I had ever felt in my life. I thought, how could I not even muster a, just a fake prayer request? Anyone who sat in any Sunday school class can do that. But I couldn't do it. And so I sat down in my seat, and at that moment I felt the lowest of lows. My spirituality was non-existent. But in a desperate plea for help, I said, oh God, help me. I don't know what you want for me, and I don't know what you want from me, but it can't be this. God, I'll do it. Just tell me. Be in Florida, Storms, clouds rolled in just about that time. There's a, trans, a uh, cupola up in the top that's all glass. And the sanctuary went dark. And I just kept praying, God help me. And after praying that for a little while, suddenly I felt warmth. I felt the glow of a single beam of light shining down on me. I looked to the right and I looked to the left. I looked in front, I looked behind, and it was dark. I felt that light on me. Not from my eyes, but in my body. 
It wasn't hot. It wasn't burning. It was the warm embrace of the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, I knew my God loved me. My life radically changed. I truly understood what it was to surrender, to submit, to love Jesus Christ. And at that moment, I became a changed person. Deep in my faith, living my faith out, not perfect by any means, but trying my best. That moment, that moment of change helped me in so many ways. If I had not had that moment, I'm certain that Jennifer would have never gone on a second date with me because she wouldn't want to marry the man that I was. I'm certain I wouldn't be Hannah's dad. I'm certain that I wouldn't have had the strength to support my wife and our family as we had our two tragic miscarriages. And I'm certain that I wouldn't have been able to get through my brother's suicide. God knew what was coming. And God knew how desperate I was, and God reached out and grabbed me and said, I love you. And you're worthy of my love. Now, I don't, I don't tell that story very often. You'll never see me put it on Facebook. You'll never see me with a flyer with it printed on there. You'll never see me, other than at this moment, standing on a soapbox, shouting it at the top of my lungs. No. I share it with people I love. I share it with you because I love you. We are in relationship. It's not pastor and pew filler. You are my family. Whether you've been here for 28 years or this is your very first time, you are my family. And so I want to share my faith story with you through love. You know, in that moment, God reached down to me and he said, Sterling, I have placed the light of the world in you, a light that cannot be hidden. Son, don't even try to hide it under a basket. Display that light so everyone can see it. Let my light shine through you so my children can see the love of their father who is on earth as it is in heaven. I understood in that moment what St. John of the Cross said when he said, the heart that lit me from the inside, it guided me and shone surer than the noonday sunlight over me and led me to the one whom only I could see deep in a place only where we could be. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about sharing our faith faithfully. The author of 1 Peter wrote in verse 15, but in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Remember back to what John Wesley taught us. He said, you have to work out your own salvation. And the best way to do that is through understanding and experiencing the manifolds of grace. The first manifold is provenient grace. That grace that comes before we know it's there. It's the grace that props us up until we know and are ready to accept Jesus Christ. The second manifold is justifying grace. That's that moment. That's that time when we say, Jesus, you are my Lord. And sin is canceled. 
It's in that moment for me when I understood the words of Charles Wesley, he canceled the power of sin and death. He set the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. Sterling Martin Allen. His blood availed for me. Then there's sanctifying grace. Sanctifying grace is the grace that we live with and that changes us, that we interact with, that we work to go from a love of sinning to alignment with Christ. The author goes on, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. I come at this a little bit differently than some modern apologists. I don't think you have to have or use a 45 second elevator speech to grab someone and say, believe in Jesus because this is what I have to tell you. I also don't believe in a message of faith and hope that intentionally and literally attempts to scare the hell out of people. I don't believe that it's effective to say, turn or burn. I think instead it's better to love, to urge, to walk with folks in faith and help them see that faith that's in you so they look for it in themselves. Verse 16 says, yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Don't jump on them. Don't rush it. The spirit will move. Help it along. The spirit has called you to do that. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. Put more simply, purify yourselves in Christ and live a holy life that all can see. To share your faith faithfully, you have to be uncomfortably comfortable with your faith to successfully share it. Uncomfortably comfortable. You see, I don't ever want you to be so comfortable in your faith that you believe there's no room for growth. You didn't hang on the cross. You didn't leave an empty tomb. There's still room to work on your faith. But, no matter where you are in the faith journey, I want you to be comfortable enough to share it. You don't have to have a testimony like me, something that's so grand and dramatic and operatic. It can be more the still small voice and how you see God working in your loved ones, a spouse, a friend, maybe your children or grandchildren or nature. We share our faith to help make the invisible God we've seen visible to all who will listen and attempt to see. We want to shine the light of Christ into the world. We want to illuminate the path of righteousness. We want to open the eyes that are temporarily blinded by Satan and sin. And we also want to invite those who can see the light in the distance but think it's too far away for them to reach because they've put too many obstacles between them and God for God ever to love them. We walk with them. We usher them to the light of Christ. You know, you'll never win a debate on faith 
trust me, I've tried. But you can win people for Christ through an honest, loving relationship. See, faith is a very personal thing. It's in your heart. It's something you can live into your own way, through your own experiences. And so if you come at someone and tell them their faith is wrong, the first thing they put up are their defenses. They'll fight for it, or they'll just walk away. You can't evangelize to someone when their back is to you. You have to invite them to turn around and come closer. But in that coming closer, you can't say, hey, right here. You have to say, hey, can we grab a cup of coffee? Hey, I saw on Facebook that something went wrong. You want to tell me about it? I'm willing just to listen. You have to be present. And you have to invite them in. Because when you're present with them, it's like when God is present with you, a real presence. Offering you that warm embrace. That light in the darkness. And friends, let me tell you, if you have a relationship that doesn't include your faith and sharing it in some way, you don't really have a relationship. You have an acquaintanceship. Because you have not been willing to invest the capital of faith into that relationship. You've taken what should be the most special thing to you and kept it out of conversations and hugs and handshakes and phone calls and text messages. That's not a relationship. A relationship is where you invest that capital of faith and you will see the dividends of that faith manifest in so many ways. It's remarkable. But you have to be the image of God, the light of Christ to those folks. There was a phenomenal missionary in India. She was born in 1929. Her name was Kumar Zia. Kumar was a Muslim woman. She, I think there's a picture of her. Can we see the picture? We don't have the picture. We just have her name. She's better looking than that, I promise. <laughs> Kumar, she was born in 1929 in India and was raised in a Muslim household but was educated in a religious school. There she was exposed to the Old Testament, and she devoured it. She was amazed by hearing stories of the same God she had always believed in and heard about, but in such a different expression. When she read Isaiah 53, where it says that God carries our burdens, she was changed. Not to Judaism and not to Christianity, still Muslim, but with different thoughts on God. Nineteen forty seven. The new established Pakistan. Her family moved into the settlement and they found for her a husband, a Muslim man. And she said, I don't want to marry a Muslim man. I don't. And her parents said, You have to. You don't have a choice. This is good for the family, therefore, it's good for you. 
So she ran away. She ran away and took refuge in an orphanage run by Christian missionaries. And at that orphanage, she was given a pocket New Testament. And just like she had with the Old Testament, she devoured it. She read it again and again and again, and she accepted Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. She changed her name from Kamar Tia to Esther John. Esther John decided the people that she wanted to minister to the most were Muslim women in Pakistan. So she went and worked in the cotton fields with them, picking cotton and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. She went to the orphanages where they turned when they had nowhere else to go, just like she had, and she comforted them, and she shared with them the gospel of Jesus Christ, her Lord and Savior. She went to work in hospitals so that she could go and see patients and tell them the story of Jesus Christ. You see, to Esther John, the story, the narrative of God is not something just to keep in your Bible or in your prayer journal up on the shelf. It's the living Word of God. And that's how she used it. She made an incredible impact. Had countless people confess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. One night in 1960, she was asleep at the missionary's home where she lived. Somebody came in. And with premeditated anger and hate, they beat her. They crushed her skull. They killed her. We think today that it may have been one of her brothers coming to right a family wrong, but we don't know that for sure. The police at that time thought it may have been a scorned love, some guy that she had jilted, maybe even the man she had been betrothed to. So they went into the missionary home and they started searching all of her things. They searched her books, they searched her journals, they opened every drawer, they flipped the mattress over, they look in, looked in the pillows, they looked everywhere. They couldn't find a clue. There was just one thing that was obvious in every part of her room. The chief of police told the missionary that she lived with, he said, I don't know who it was, but I will tell you the only person that this woman loved is your Savior, Jesus. Now, if Esther John could share faithfully the gospel of Jesus Christ in Pakistan, in the earliest days of Pakistan, What's keeping you from doing it in Houston, Texas? The buckle of the Bible belt in 2021. Friends, let me be a prophetic voice sharing with you the Spirit's call. The Spirit is calling you to believe, to grow, and to share in your faith faithfully. You have to be uncomfortably comfortable with your faith in order to share it. You are to make the invisible God whom we've seen visible to those who will listen and attempt to see and win people for Christ through honest, loving relationships. The scripture that Ben read earlier says, I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. Jesus said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole 
of creation. Let us pray. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story. Twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Friends, our closing hymn is, They'll Know We Are Christians by Our Love. I invite you to stand and join in singing together. that's what we're to do. We're supposed to go into the world and show the love of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Go into the world and radiate to everyone that love of Christ. Go and be good shepherd. That's all it means. Go embody the transforming love of Jesus in every relationship. And as we go from this place, Go with this blessing. Let's share it together. It comes straight out of Scripture. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, both now and forevermore. Amen. Oh, mm-hmm.